Right, hi everyone, uh, I'm your lecturer Dr. Fong. Welcome to this lecture on CM3291. We are doing it on advanced experiments in organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. You might contact me on my Twitter account at Ken Fenman. So today's experiment is about the asymmetric synthesis of the Jacobson's ligands. It has a lot of history and heritage related to it, and I'll talk about it a bit more before we dive into the experimental and the theory of this experiment. So First up is chirality. You have learned in organic chemistry in the first year, second year, and even third year about the importance of chirality and what this term means. So for instance, in the world around us, most of the organisms are chiral. So for instance, we look at our hands here. You raise your hands up. Our hands are chiral because if you try to put your left hand into right hand glove, the winter glove, you can't fit inside, right? So the term chirality means that you have a mirror image of itself that's non-superimposable on itself. So for instance, if you have a chiral center, a carbon with four different groups here, you do a mirror, and when you do a clockwise or anticlockwise rotation, you can't superimpose it. It's not the same molecule, right? And in the next case, at the bottom, you have a non-chiral carbon, which is called a chiral carbon, in which you have a fluorine, hydrogen, and two chlorines there. When you rotate it, right, in the mirror image, it can be superimposed. Because you see a mirror plane cutting across this part here is is okay. So we know that all living systems are chiral. Like for instance, all the amino acids with a chiral carbon, chiral center could be a nitrogen. Uh, sugars are chiral. DNAs, RNAs, right? And take a look at this molecule. And some of these amino acids have multiple chiral centers. And we have a molecule with more than one chiral centers that give rise to even diastereomers, right? Or epimers. So do check out your previous work and do some revision. Right. So to conclude, chirality is one of the most important concepts in organic chemistry and the major reason that uh, we have different enantiomers uh, having different biological activity in the living organisms is just due to this uh, chiral effect of uh, the building molecules in the living system. Okay. So let's continue. Now with uh, more and more studies, right, it's now very clear that uh, a drug may only be active in one of uh, its enantiomeric form, right? While the other enantiomers may be less active, inactive, or even toxic and harmful to humans. So one of the most famous examples of uh, these chiral drugs is the sedative uh, thalidomide here, right? You see on the left, uh, which led to what was historical is the thalidomide tragedy in the mid-20th uh, century pertaining to Europe, uh, most important in Germany and also in South America. So it was so, you know, during the late uh, 1950s and early 1960s, right, and the racemic form of this uh, thalidomide was uh, mainly prescribed for the morning sickness of uh, pregnant women, right, uh, and unfortunately, you know, approximately uh, 10,000 children were born with the mouth formation because the, the R in antoma of this thalidomide is effective against the morning sickness, but the S isomer is teragonogenic. What it means is, right, the babies were born with uh, deformed limbs, you know, and um, they do not look so normal. And it's very tragic because uh, when they synthesized the molecule, they didn't know, right? But after it was uh, taken by the pregnant women and it shows that, oh, um, the babies were deformed and they investigated and showed that, oh, the S is almost the one that's in tragedy. But because the company at the time didn't want to waste it, so they shipped to to uh, the South America and they, they draw a, a packaging saying that if you have a, a baby, let me just draw it for you here, you know, it deserves uh, some kind of highlight here. So what they did was, right, they show on the packaging and they put this, uh, both in antomas of this thalidomide and they put here a circle and they put a little baby, right, and then they put a cross here to show that, right, uh, if they want to show that if you're pregnant, don't take this drug because you know you can, uh, you know, have some painkiller, but you don't want to have deformed babies. But the thing is, at the time, right, it was in the you know, 1950s to 1960s, people are not very uh, literate, they're not well studied, so they interpret it as if I take the drug, I won't have babies. So it's a kind of contraceptive. So, which means that people, you know, who, who took this drug as a contraceptive means that not not even that it didn't work as a contraceptive, but they give birth to more deformed babies. It's very tragic, 
right? And then the reason is why, why you know, don't you, you know, put many words to explain? Because at the time, people didn't go to school, took no many of them, so they used this kind of pictorial uh, image there. But as you see, it was very tragic, and we learned a big lesson from there. Now, the, the other thing is, um, besides the importance of this separation here, that one is so so toxic and uh, does a lot of bad things to the to the mankind in history. So we look at the second example here. Let me just change to a laser pointer over K here. Now, the, another example is your Sita Loprem, right? So the R isomer is effective against a depressive disorder, but the S in N tumor has a less than 1% antidepressant effect. So if you do not separate this, it's okay, right? But uh, you don't want to to cheat your customers here, right? So you can say, oh, this is a Sita Loprem, right? They, if they don't study chemistry like you, they might think that it's 100% the effective drug, but neither do they know that the S isomer doesn't have much effect. Okay, yeah. So the last example I want to give is your DOPA. So the L DOPA is effective against the Parkinson's disease, but the D DOPA is toxic, right? So this is important not to mix them and then give to the patient. So for more information, you can read on these sources. Okay, yeah. So what happened was right in uh, the 1992, right, the U.S. Um, Food and Drug uh, Administration, the FDA, uh, issued a very formal guideline on chiral drugs development because of all these cases that happened in the past year. So any racemic drug, right, they have to be studied importantly. The R and S isomers, you know, before uh, it's developed into a single enantiomer form, right, which is pure, right. You want the pure form, then you check uh, whether this has some ill effects to humans or even to the society, to the ecosystem. And then before they approve the marketing of this a more effective uh, single enantiomer in the final product to the patients, right? Okay. So now how do we separate these uh, chiral molecules? So there's a couple of ways here. Uh, one is right. You know, enantiomers have uh, the same physical property, and I would say most chemical property, right? Just that their handiness is different. Now, but if you react it with another enantiomer, this chiral, what you will get is a uh, pair of diastereomer, which they differ by only one chiral center, which means it's RS versus RR, or uh, SR versus SS. So these two you can't separate because uh, they have the same melting point, boiling point, but if you react with a pure chiral agent, let's say called a plus B, and then you join them, you have, you see, plus plus and plus minus. So these are a pair of diastereomer, because then when you have a diastereomer pair, they have different boiling point, they have different chemical property, then you can separate and purify it to a single enantiomer and then separate them. It's just like uh, taking two pieces of Lego, putting them together, it's different, then you pluck it out again, you can recycle this uh, chiral agent, and then of course you retrieve your purified form of your enantiomer A. Right. Next, we can also use an uh, instrument that's high technology, we call it chiral HPLC. Some of you might have used it in uh, CM2192 in uh, analytical experiments, but the column is something we can change because when you pass the sample through it, right, the column, right, we can fit in in the in the inner walls something of a chiral property. So imagine, right, uh, inside the the column you have a lot of glove. That's right hand glove. So when you put your hands through it, right, the one that's right hand will uh, hold on to it more because it can interact better. The ones that's left hand can't fit, so it just go off. So that's how we separate in the process here, right? It's about how easy for for the stationary phase to interact with your your substrate there. Okay, so this uh, I created this image from uh, Dr. House on YouTube, and for more on HPLC, uh, you might want to read up. You know this uh, video clip. We show you uh, how do you recognize the HPLC system, uh, what is the mechanism behind the separation process, etc. Okay, now let me just dive in further into this uh, column separation of this chiral HPLC analogy. Let me try again. So imagine you have a red carpet handshake, you know, red carpet, just like a celebrity going for a movie screening, right? So what happens is, you see red carpet, wow, all the fans are gathered there by the side, by the aisle, and you wait for the stars to come, and they're waving at you, they want to shake your hand, right? So they know that you're coming from one direction, they want to shake your hand, so maybe they all raise their right hand, ah, hello, hello, I'll take a photo. And as they walk here, right, those who, right, are in the opportunity to shake their right hand, will meet. Because if you shake, if you put your left hand out, then you know, it's just very awkward to, to hold a hand right in this manner, so they will you know, just skip it. Which means that they will ignore right the other handshakes. Which means that only 
the selective form of the right handshakes. You know, we interact, the staffs will go there, you know, and stop, you know, and talk, maybe take some selfie, right, and before they proceed. So what it means is, it is um, in a similar fashion, your coverage HPRC column, right, one of the direction is more favored than the other. Okay, hope you get this analogy. Now, another way to separate this caro in entomas is using a molecular resolution. So you see this example taken from Claydon, right? Uh, you see the starting molecule. There isn't a caro center first, but if you do a nucleophilic addition here to form a cyanohydrin and afterwards do a hydrolysis, you have an amine here, an amino acid, pardon, a racemic amino acid. So a 50-50% of a, the equivalent form of enantiomer. Now what you can do is first you react with um, acid anhydride, and then uh, next you have this uh, sodium mentoxide, right, you see, chiro, triple chiro center. Then you have a diastereomer A and B. And mind you, you want to count the number of chiro centers here, right? One, two, no, that's two, two, three, four, okay? Then you crystallize it because right, uh, your diastereomers have different crystallization property. One will be crystallized first and they won't mix. And then you can separate the two layers, right? Get the crystals out at a certain temperature, right? And then you dry off the mother liquor, which is, uh, you know, you make it very concentrated. Remember how you put the seed crystal, right? Concentrate it and then let it cool. Uh, this is what it means there. So as you know, and I mentioned before that the diastereomer have different physical property, the melting point, you can also, you know, take down the crystal, right? And you check and ascertain that this is your diastereomer A by looking at the polarimetry test, right? You know which one they rotate and the angle of rotation. And of course, now they're separated into two pure separate crystals. You can do a hydrolysis to remove this agent that you added in and you get back what you started off with, okay? Like that. All right, so you resolve your two in tumors. Okay, yeah. So, voila, this is it. Yeah. So I want to just add that uh, this part is to protect. Uh, we call your organic chemistry mechanisms here, right? It's not just adding everything you need, but you look at all the other groups, what you need to protect, right? So in this case, uh, you need to protect your amine group, right? Uh, by having a condensation reaction before you add this, but if not, there's some side reactions because you have a nucleophilic, a very good uh, alkoxide alco nucleophile that can remove uh, certain parts here. And of course, you're going to deprotect it, right? Okay, now so people ask, why not, you know, we make a single enantiomer from scratch, right? So it's it's pretty, pretty good. And uh, people actually thought about it, you know, before this um, earlier, we talk about this FDA, FDA guideline, right, about, you know, you need to make a single enantiomer. Actually, organic chemists around the world, um, they have really started to develop methods to, you know, synthesize a single enantiomer. And they call this synthesis uh, asymmetric synthesis. Asymmetric because it's not symmetrical, right? So it's one of them. In which one of the enantiomer is produced predominantly over the other enantiomer. So a milestone in this development was uh, asymmetric catalysis. It was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 2001. Well, still very young for you and me. And to Sharpless, this is K. Barry Sharpless, right, for his work in the chirally catalyzed oxidation reactions, right? And Noel's and Norori, right, for their work on the uh, chirally catalyzed hydrogenation reaction. So it's still about synthesizing a molecule in a chiral fashion, right? So this is the Nobel Prize, and they're still very young men in 2001, right? Now it's been 21 years. <laughs> so I have been uh, very fortunate to you know to share the same same panel and spoke with them and chatted with them uh, in the kind of online conference during the COVID. You know, they're very nice men, very very humble. You know, they teach a lot of things and share the journey. And this is a uh, Barry Sharpless, and people call him Barry, but say Professor Sharpless. <laughs> Good times, uh. So. And I want to talk about last year in 2021, right? It was also the second time where they awarded the Nobel Prize to asymmetric synthesis, right? To two professors, a professor Benjamin List in, from Germany and a professor now Sir, right? Just got knighted by the Queen Elizabeth, uh, David Macmillan, right? Uh, from Scotland. So this is uh, their work. Um, one Nobel Prize, a bit of a surprise. 
uh, because of other during uh, yeah, the COVID stuff. So they make catalysts to, to ensure that one of the enantiomers will reproduce more predominantly. Okay, so this is very, very fresh in our mind that 